There are two seaplane fly-ins in the month of June in the state of Michigan. The first one is the second weekend of the month, which is Gaylord, Michigan, followed by this one, the Grand Marais seaplane fly-in. Welcome to the 8th Annual Seaplane Fly in a Grand Marais, Michigan. Penny Picorni and I, Dave Poam, are here to represent the Seaplane Pilots Association and show you around so you can see what's happening at this fly-in and perhaps come next year. Welcome. This is our eighth annual seaplane fly-in. It's a, a weekend festival in Grand Marais, Michigan, not Grand Marais, Minnesota. <laughs> and we, we used to get some calls from Grand Marais, Minnesota wondering, where's this fly-in you're talking about? And we're Grand Marais, Michigan. So we have about 25 seaplanes that will come in. They start coming in today, Friday, and there'll be some that come in again tomorrow morning, Saturday. We have a huge potluck dinner tonight. Tomorrow morning we'll have a briefing meeting. What's really unique about our fly-in is we are welcomed by several uh, federal agencies. We'll have the National Park people here tomorrow to welcome the seaplane pilots from the uh, Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, which is at Grand Marais here. We just had the Border Patrol Customs show up and they'll be here to welcome the seaplane pilots from the Customs Department. We'll have the sheriff here to say hi. We have a United States Coast Guard permit to land seaplanes in a restricted area on Lake Superior, which is a first of, that anybody's ever even done this. So here we are with a United States Coast Guard permit. We have a Board of Health permit for all of our food activities. We have the National Park welcoming us. We have the Border Patrol. We'll have the state police here to say hi to. We have a ball. Yeah. We have our fly-in on Great Lakes waters. We're on Lake Superior. And we ask the United States Coast Guard if we can have a restricted area that's safe so that we can run our contests with our seaplane pilots right on the bay. And so they come and close off a section of Lake Superior water on Grand Marais Bay for us to have our fly-in. from New Carlisle, Ohio. I'm flying the white and red Super Cub uh, on Anfibs. Its uh, end number is 383 Charlie Charlie. We're out of Ohio. And you're camping here? And we're gonna camp here. <laughs> okay. uh, my name is Dan Jervey. I'm from Iron River, Michigan. I'm flying a 1946 Taylorcraft VC-12D with a 90 horse Continental on Bauman 1500 floats. First time here? First time here, yeah.
nice and warm. What? Must be 65, 70 degrees. Yeah, we stopped on the way back. She went skinny dipping for about a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> and now she's sneezing. <laughs> okay, I'm Jay. That's uh, my Lake Buccaneer from Omaha, Nebraska. I flew up here yesterday to Grand Marais. This is my fourth year in a row I've come to Grand Marais. Um, Lake Buccaneer is uh, made by Aerofag Corporation uh, when, I, when I bought the airplane and this was, uh, we bought it new. My late father and I bought this airplane in 1979, we bought it brand new and I, so we're the, about the only lake out there that we're the, I'm the original owner of, it still exists. Uh, lake Buccaneer is a factory made certificated airplane, four place. Uh, it's got a four cylinder IO360 fuel injected engine, 200 horsepower. This is obviously not the original paint. It's uh, painted up by, like my airline. I fly for JetBlue, and the, when I showed the company what I wanted to do with the paint scheme, they, my airline gave me the paint. So it's painted up just like my, air, my airline is. I fly for a living. I've been uh, flying this airplane since uh, 1979 when it was new, and uh, I spent 30 years in the Air Force, retired as a colonel, and now I'm, this is my retirement job: is to fly airlines and fly a Lake Buccaneer. But it's a fun airplane. It's uh, handles well in the water. It, uh, it's not too fast, it's kind of dirty uh, aerodynamically, but it, it gets you there about 10 gallons an hour. And we take it, uh, we take it all over. We've, I've had it to both coasts, I've had it up into Canada, I have yet to take it down to Mexico, but that's on my list of things to do as well. Hello Dave, welcome to uh, Grand Marais Flying, Tom Becky, HNPE. And you're the official greeter? I guess I get assigned that task, so... And you carry luggage for people? We do. And who's your co-pilot in the seat here? That is my uh, boss, that's Angel. <laughs> and she greets everybody. Either with a lick or a bite. So. <laughs> Everybody brought grills, so you had your choice on which one you wanted to cook your steak, hot dog, or brat on. After the potluck supper on Friday night, Ed dug a hole in the ground and made it a campfire site. And of course, after the fly-in, they put the sod back into the ground again, so you'd never know there was a campfire there. The mosquitoes didn't come out until late, so there was a nice evening to enjoy each other's company and talk about what else but flying. You know, rather to go easier, just yeah. give it to them. We got a new tent this year. It's bigger. It's another tent for Alaska. Yeah. Only it's the next size bigger. So. Oh, real nice. I was able to put my army cot in there with the. I feel good to lean right into it. She does. He does. Yeah. Do He's a leaner. Yeah, you lean right into that. Oh, he says that feels so good. Yeah, that feels so good. Yeah. I said you're coming over. Oh, yeah. Isn't that nice? Oh.
called Steve this morning about uh, 8 o'clock and Cliff was still sleeping. Ah, oh, that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> Yeah, he was still sleeping, they said. He was partying all night. Oh, Mark Stockwell. Where are you from? Oh, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. How far is that? Oh, 240 like, miles. Okay. Tell me about the airplane. Uh, it's a 1954 uh, uh, Beaver. And uh, in 2004, it was converted uh, to a turbine Beaver at Whip Air. Saturday morning also brought a flea market right next to the seaplane cookout area. Then I can stay in the fight. In one spot like oh, that. it hurts me, minutes, yeah, so I'll I'll it too. Yeah, I can't do it. Did you hear about the call we had last night? Yeah. No. About the fireworks? EMT? No. Um, I almost killed some kids last night, but Ernie? I couldn't reach him. Huh? Ernie Brooks? Yeah. 90 pounds of onion. I'm going to write that down. No recreation on both sides. I thought it was coming back. Yeah. Let's give Howard a hand too. Uh, did the National Park Service show up yet? No. They were going to stop. I pretty much know what they're going to visit about. Uh, so, they're mainly concerned if you fly over the National Park that you don't fly close to the big pictured rock, the uh, Miner's Castle Rock, which is quite a bit west of here. There's a huge deck there and a stairway and a lot of people, a lot of visitors. They would appreciate it if you keep at least 500 feet from that area. As many of you know, the 2,000 foot is... Uh, a request if you guys want an advisory for flying over the national park they would like to think that you'd be 2,000 feet you legally can be 500 feet remember you can't land on any lake within the park particularly Sabo Lake which is right out here uh, we had a widgeon land out there one year it took him three years to finally settle his uh, problem with the National Park Service. They wanted to take his widget. We need to do something about that. Yeah. That's right. If we want to protect the judges, we'll put the judges on the raft. Because you guys never hit the raft. That's right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, do you get any points if you do hit the judges? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, extra points. <laughs> well, that starts at three, as most of you know. And then we'll also have the two <laughs> yellow buoys out there for the spot landing contest. We'll have a boat at the buoy also, a boat at the, by the raft for the balloon drop and another boat out by the buoy. Remember, you've got to clear the imaginary line. <coughs> See how close you can get to it. You can't land in front of that imaginary line between the two yellow buoys. You guys all know this. You can't bounce. Those okay? two yellow cups out there you're talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yellow cup. Yeah, We've right already given him his trophy. I don't know why he's, you know, but anyway. So you can't bounce. And uh, on the balloon drop, 200 foot minimum, AGL. When you land and touch down past the imaginary line, you can't come back off the water. Correct, the second bounce, second yeah. landing point. Yeah. Third, third, fourth. Yeah. <laughs> Spot landing contest, you guys tell me. I've always been under the, when you're on, you're downwind and getting ready to turn base, Whatever that you can. can't add any more power. Jerry, what do you, that, generally, you still want to do that? or hold power, but you're not supposed to add power. You want to still hold it to where you can't add power? Basically, okay. okay, so when you guys are turning off base to final, you can't add power. 
yeah. on your spot landing. Basically, you got to do whatever you got to do to fly safe. Well, You're fly safe at all times. Sinking or something, you need oh, to add yeah. power, you got to add power. Yeah, but as far as sure. the imaginary yeah, line. <laughs> yeah, but you don't want somebody stalling out because, no. because no. they're going to get accused of cheating or something. Yeah, that's right. Just land on the so, <laughs> in case we have wind shear or something, that's okay. Well, the reason we've got the Coast Guard here is they can tow you in. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll do it at wind shear. <laughs> anyway, we start at 3. Uh, fish boil starts between 5 and 5.30. That's what yes, Last year they were kind of close to this end. Yep. I'd like to see them target down so you've got more places yeah. to run all the What we would like to do is, when we get started, we usually have a few of you up here, and on the radio we're talking to the guys that are placing the buoys. So if you could be here, Chuck Marshall used to help us with it. So it depends on the wind, and, and right now it's 11 o'clock. The wind could be 180 degrees from right now, you know, by, by uh, 3. So we'll place the buoys just prior to the event, and then everybody's up here anyway to get their blooms, and we'll all kind of meet and say, well, let's go a little more here, a little more there. Uh, remember the, t t the wires here, guys. Remember that the balls are not on the top wires. I could, I could really make that a fun conversation. But they're on the lower wires, so you got to still. Is that so? Another... When you fly under it, you see them. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is Grand Beret. They just figured, you know, these guys are flying under the wires. We'll put the balls on the lower wires. Verify that. The balls hang low up here. Any other questions? Anything else? Yes, sir. Fuel. You mentioned price on fuel. Oh, that is interesting. It's in the red truck down here. Yeah. I have no idea. What is he charging for fuel? Six bucks. Whatever there he is. Six bucks a gallon. Six? There, okay. Leon? Leon. Six bucks a gallon. Yep. Hundred low lead. Uh, little bit of water. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tom, uh, Tom will shuttle it with his uh, John Deere Gator. And we have three yeah, cans, no. well, five-gallon cans. Better off yeah, back here. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you want? That, I, well, it's up to you guys, but you know it's kind of foolish to. I got a hundred foot of hose. Okay. They can just taxi right over close to the truck. Okay. Shoot it in. Why don't you and Tom work that out then, with with the oh, pilot that needs the fuel? It would be bombing. Okay. Yeah, because if they're worried about spillage. The can will spill before And you can the, meter the fuel on the truck. It's on the, right there on the gate. Uh, handle. The first thing yep. Thank you for coming. Yeah, but that's You're welcome. It's great. Stuff. And uh, Oh, well then I'll do that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave Stoll, S-T-U-L-L. -L. I'm out of New Carlisle, Ohio, flying a white and red Super Cub, PA-18. In numbers, 383, Charlie, Charlie. It's on whip line floats and it's got a 180 horse Lycoming engine in it. We're here at Grand Marais. We're having a great time. We're going to go take a ride. How many years have you been here? Oh boy, I've been coming every year except a couple, I think. I've been here quite a few years. T -t Tell me about your tie down. Okay, the, the tie downs are actually a fence anchor, is what they are. I've cut them off, made them a little shorter so they fit down in the float compartments. And then the orange bumpers I stick over there for identification so nobody runs into them or whatever. And it's a good, good way to mark my, uh, my spot here. To have a better perspective of what the Grand Marais Bay looked like, David Stahl took me up for a ride in his Super Cub on amphibian floats. If you look at a road map or an aviation map, it doesn't look like there's much room to have a seaplane flying, but once you fly over the area, you can see there's really quite ample space to conduct uh, water flying activities. We're looking towards the west at the present time. 
coming up to the Bay Area right in town at Grand Marais. Uh, as soon as we get a little bit closer, you can get a perspective of what the beaching area looks like where everybody could tie down. And there, of course, there's tent camping right on the beach as there's a public restroom uh, right next to it. Perfect spot for a fly-in. Great little town, some great restaurants. And one of the restaurants has homemade beer, several types, and also homemade root beer. in its tandem seating. That is that you've got uh, one uh, person seated behind the, uh, the other. In this particular case, Jerry is forward and he's doing the fine. And his, uh, his uh, balloon drop assistant is a young fellow named Lyle. And Lyle is uh, from the seating area. And uh, I think that uh, Lyle is probably having the time of his life uh, because they've got the side uh, of that J3 wide open. You can hang out there. So uh, Lyle's mother wants him to be sure to have his seatbelt on. <laughs> and Lyle, uh, I'm sure, has got that uh, water-filled balloon in hand, and uh, he's the bombardier. So let's see how good a job he does. Jerry will yell, now, and out will come the balloon. You wait and see. Let's see how he does on this. Now he's trying to beat his previous drop of 60 feet. Let's see how well it goes. This is probably 
Delta with the spot land. Yeah. Okay, all eyes on uh, Bravo Delta, the uh, Cub on the spot landing. That looks good for me or nothing, folks, but maybe it's a little early. Who knows? That way, one, two, Victor, the Luke is on the roll. One, two, Victor. Lake one, two, Victor. He was short. That jet blue right here, I got it. Yeah, it's jet blue. Yeah, so I rolled it down. Well, okay. What was that? Uh, like? uh, 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 okay, so one, two, three. Giovanni. Giovanni. 
Yeah. Flies an Airbus 320. Yeah. He's from the Philippines. Up here visiting with relatives from Detroit. Okay. We want to welcome uh, someone who's traveled quite a distance to take in uh, his uh, first um, float plane splash in. And uh, we want to welcome Giovanni from uh, the Philippines. Giovanni flies an A320. No, Airbus. 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 Airbus 320, which happens to be the largest passenger aircraft at the present time. Okay, Paul Bennett has just handed me the results of uh, the events, and the winner in the blue drop is Beyond uh, Everhart, Beyond from Gould City, and uh, you'll remember his uh, closest was one foot. Coming in second was David Stowe. David Stowe from New Carlisle, Ohio, at six feet. Second in the blue drop contest. But then David turns out to be the winner of the spot landing contest at 20 feet. Twenty uh, poker is backing out for the takeoff contest. All this talking and I can't hear. Um, my ears are shot. So uh, David Stowe wins the uh, spot landing contest at 20 feet. Coming in second is Jerry Ness. Jerry Ness. Uh, as I say, it's from the uh, Escanaba area, and uh, uh, Jerry uh, uh, scored a 40, 40 feet on the uh, spot landing contest. So, first in the blue drop was uh, Leon Everhart, and uh, first in the spot landings was uh, David Stowe. Hi, Ma. Hi, Ma. Hi, Ma. Still running. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Hi. Oh, Good evening, Araya. I want to say hello. Oh, back there. Oh, <laughs> 
go back. That's really cool. You'll find it in still line. Think those things? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, kidding him on the radio because with his Lake End favorite. He currently is a driver for JetBlue out of New York. He's an airline pilot. And, and he takes his week's vacation and comes here for, the, for our fly-in. And he, le he leaves Nebraska to pick up Penny, or uh, Nancy. Nancy in Minnesota. Right. Okay. And then they, they, go, they come here and he's had the same place in that motel now for four years. And you're flying uh, which aircraft again from JetBlue? I'm flying the Airbus. You're, he's flying. flying the big Airbus for JetBlue. How many passengers? 150. 150. Yeah. Now, before that, he retired as a B-52 pilot. Okay? And now, I asked him to think about a funny story about flying a B-52. So we're going to let you go ahead. Well, you didn't tell me I had to tell you a funny story, but I can tell you a story. All right, tell us a story about flying the big B-52. Eight inches. Eight, Eight inches. inches. Now, how much? How much time do I have? No, you have about two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I was going to tell about uh, when I was commander of a B-52 squadron. I took command of a B-52 squadron in uh, July of 1990, and in August of 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and I was tasked with a what they call a leadership package to go from the United States, to go all the way over to the Middle East, to take out the leadership of, of our nation decided that that was, in fact, what we needed to do. So from August until January of uh, 1990, and finally January of 91, we ultimately launched on that mission. We no longer were going to try to strike Hussein, but we were, in fact, were going to take out all the early warning systems that were in uh, Saudi Arabia, or excuse me, that were in Iraq. So we took out the early warning radars, the command and control systems, the uh, power supplies of those, and then we turned around and we flew all the way back. And I took off from Barksdale Air Force Base, which is about by Shreveport, Louisiana, all the way over to the Middle East, and then all the way back with five air refuelings. Each B-52 took on 1.1 million pounds of gas per airplane. We launched the weapons, they were at that time highly classified GPS guided munitions. Now this is 1991, the world didn't know that GPS guided munitions even existed, which is why it was also classified. And then, like I said, we flew all the way back nonstop. The end of the mission was 30, about 36 and a half hours, and I took a seven airplane package over and all the way back, and everybody came back in one piece. So that's my B-52 story. Great. <laughs> that's, that's when he started to drink. <laughs> For that. Thank you. You bet. I'd love to have Lee Goy come up. Lee, come on. You got to come up here. Lee is a local native. You know what's really kind of neat? The, the the key people, I guess the key people that help put on the splash in are four seaplane pilots that all live on the bay. Uh, myself and Bob Caldwell and Tom Banky and Lee. Lee is a seaplane pilot but have you been watching the weather channel when they're doing all these stories about how weather changed history have you watched the story about the female doctor that was at the South Pole and had cancer and so they had to send a C-130 C-130 on skis and I was talking to Lee about that and he says oh yeah I've done that mission three times as captain of a C-130 
So tell us a couple of. It wasn't me. Oh, <laughs> it was my squadron that was your squadron. To do it. Okay, tell us a couple. Tell us a story about when your skis wouldn't work on your aircraft and uh, you were getting ready for a crash landing. What was the size of that aircraft? Well, the C-130 is a good sizable aircraft, four-engine turboprop that the military has been using and civilian uh, outfits have been buying it for rough country work uh, since the early 1950s. The airplane is still in production after all these years. and. Uh, the squadron that I was attached to was uh, the military airlift support for the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Research Program. And uh, we flew people, we flew parts, we flew uh, disassembled buildings, we flew disassembled D-8 Caterpillar tractors, anything that you wanted uh, down in Antarctica to support the Antarctic Research Program, we flew it. And uh, it was probably one of the most interesting and most satisfying uh, times that I had. I spent 28 years in the Navy flying and really enjoyed that. It was quite interesting. When were you flying when your skis got all tangled up? Well, I had taken off from the main base at McMurdo Station in Antarctica and was carrying a, an internal fuel tank in the cargo compartment of the C-130. Uh, that would be discharged into a bladder farm where they had huge bladders of fuel stashed at these outlying bases in Antarctica. Uh, everybody used the same fuel for Caterpillar tractors, for diesel generator units, uh, you name it. If it ran on anything, it ran on Arctic diesel fuel. And uh, I had just taken off with a full load of Arctic diesel to carry it to an inland uh, camp, and the guys in the control tower at McMurdo Station called me just as I broke the ground and said, hey, don't raise your landing gear, something's the matter with your nose ski. And uh, we've got a little hole down in the nose wheel well where you can get up to the back end of the nose wheel well, look out through a heavy plastic window, and you can see into that nose wheel well. All we could see was the back end of the ski sticking up right toward the belly of the airplane. <laughs> The bow of the ski had to be pointing nearly straight down from what we could see. We couldn't see it. And uh, we made several flybys uh, the control tower to let them look at it. They scoped us with binoculars and couldn't figure out why the ski was like that, but it was not good. And uh, I guess everybody had the opinion that when I tried to land the airplane, uh, tip of that ski was going to dig in and rip the whole nose gear out of the airplane and Lord knows what was going to happen after that. So we had never had anything like this occur before. One thing we wanted to do was lighten the airplane before we landed so I dumped several thousand pounds of Arctic diesel fuel all over the place. Uh, I'm not proud of that but there wasn't anything else to do. And. Uh, came in to attempt the landing, and uh, as best we can tell, uh, I experienced a completely normal landing out of that. I touched down as slow as I could, uh, just above stall speed, and uh, eased the nose over while I still had flying speed very gently, as gently as I could. And it seemed after all was over that it had been a perfectly normal landing. And uh, the best that they could figure out was that there had been a reduction in pressure from the airflow between the tip of the ski and the surface as I, as I approached uh, setting that nose ski down. And it just lifted the front end of the ski until it was almost parallel with the ground, just as I set it down. So I lucked out. And I've heard of one other aircraft having this happen to them in the years since then. This was in 1965, and uh, they did have some damage to the aircraft. Mine, the only damage was to the actuator that had ripped out at one end and it allowed the ski to drop in that direction. There was no other collateral damage. How come Jay Beard is drinking wine and you're not, <laughs> after all this? 
couldn't account for that. <laughs> <laughs> Lee has so many stories as a Navy commander. He's had carrier landings, been a carrier pilot. Only for those landings. I didn't. I never. I never served in a carrier-based squadron. I had about 12 carrier landings in my career in three different airplanes, but that was it. It was just for training purposes. But he's a lot of fun. He has a home on the water with his wife Betty right here. He's down the bay, so he's right on the bay. And he's been helping us from day one with all the splash ins. Lee also is a partner with us in the Cessna out at the airport that we have. So we're still trying to keep him active flying. So thanks very much, Lee. We appreciate it. Dave, jump in. Dave's going to say a few words. And you only got two minutes. <laughs> First of all, uh, it's an honor to be here among you. Penny and I, as the founder of the association, to represent the Seaplane Pilots Association on behalf of Dr. Jim McManus, our executive director, and Telford Allen, our president. It's our second year here. And I happen to agree with that. It's nice to see a small group fly instead of 500 airplanes, if you will. 